Professor Tyler Anbinder is a specialist in 19th century American politics and the history of immigration and ethnicity in American life. A prolific author, Dr. Anbinder's most recent book, City of Dreams, the 400-year epic history of immigrant New York, has been critically acclaimed as brilliant, timely, and unforgettable. Tyler, welcome. Thank you. Tyler, I'd like to begin by asking you a question. You in your book talk about Italian barbers, Dominican livery drivers, really the essence of, uh, of America in many ways. Has there been something different between what happened yesteryear and now in the immigrant experience? Not really. When you look at the immigrant experience over the 400 years of American history, what you find is pretty much the same story repeating itself over and over again. So even though we tend to think that today's immigrants are, are different than those from the past, that they can't possibly be like my grandparents or great grandparents, what you find if you, if you write the history of American immigration is that each generation of immigrants pretty much goes through the same things as those from the past. Their trip to America is very unforgettable to them. Uh, their period of adjustment is very difficult. Um, they're often, they're almost always treated uh, kind of badly by a significant number of immigrants. But they eventually adjust and they're eventually accepted and, and their ethnic group, which seems very foreign at one point, eventually becomes accepted in American society. And so much so that that group will then go on and be the ones who make it hard for the next immigrant group. And so that story tends to be repeated over and over again. So you also have many brilliant stories in this book. Were there any surprises uh, in your research and in your writing? Well, as a historian, you always hope to be surprised. One of my favorite surprises I found in researching the book actually uh, had to do with G uh, George Washington University. I found during the Civil War, there was a, uh, a soldier, an Irish immigrant soldier, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor for Valor at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And he's somewhat well known because he writes what's probably the most racist letter you can find written by a Union soldier in which he's writing to his sister and they're talking about whether or not they're going to allow African Americans to fight in the Union Army. And, and this Irish immigrant says that he's very much against that. He says that the Irish are too good to have to fight side by side with African Americans. It's a, a very racist letter. It gets quoted in a lot of textbooks. What I found when I looked into his story more carefully was that there was more to it than that. That later on in the war, a couple of years after he writes that letter, when African American uh, regiments are being formed, the Union has a lot of trouble finding white soldiers who are willing to volunteer to be the officers for those groups. But who volunteers? The very same uh, person, Felix Brannigan. Then after the war, his story becomes even more interesting. He moves to Washington. He goes to law school at the Columbian College, what will become George Washington University, gets his law degree, um, and is assigned to be an assistant U.S. attorney in Mississippi, where he spends his several years there prosecuting Klansmen for violence against African Americans. And so he goes from being someone who seems very racist to someone who seems uh, to have grown and changed over the course of the war. And so I, th I think his story uh, kind of encapsulates what happens to ma many Americans as uh, the Civil War and the Civil War years go on. Well, that's amazing. Uh, and I've also something else as a dean that really, um, really tickles me is that you involve students in this research. What did that look like and how were they involved? Well, students were involved in almost every aspect of the research. Um, on the one hand, I use students to do fact checking and quote checking, which is really important. One thing I always tell my students is never trust another historian. And so when I would have a quote in my manuscript from, uh, from a book written by another historian, I would have the students go and track down the original source cited by those historians. And my students found dozens of mistakes and thus saved me from making those same mistakes. Um, another thing I had students do was translating documents. We have a great wealth of language skills among our students. So I had one undergraduate uh, translate German documents uh, into English, documents written by German immigrants. I had another student translate uh, newspapers written in Yiddish into English for, for me to use in my manuscript. And then one of the best things I had students do was do original research in uh, documents about Irish, German, uh, Italian and Jewish immigrants 
uh, in order to kind of better tell their story. And for some of the students, they not only did that research for me, but then they used their exposure to those documents uh, to decide to write their own uh, research papers, or in a couple of cases, even senior theses. So it was a kind of uh, experience that was good for me, and it was good for the students, too. Well, I've got to say, Professor Anbinder, your reputation precedes you. You are well known uh, on campus and among our alumni as being a master teacher. Uh, how do you get students excited about history, and how do you get them to think like a historian? Well, I find that the best way to get students excited about history is to show them first uh, how many great stories there are in history. A lot of students come to college thinking that history is about the memorization of facts. And so one of the first things I have to do is, uh, is show them that that's not the case, that, that it's not a coincidence that the word story is a central part of the term history, that stories are what make good history. And so I let them know that. I let them know that memorizing facts isn't so important and that really understanding the story of events, say, in American history or, or whatever history you're studying is really important. And then the other thing I try to do is make them into historians themselves. And so give them access to documents that allow them to figure out the story themselves, uh, present them with interesting questions, and then let them be the ones to answer them. And these days, especially with, with so much being digitized, I find that digital history is a great, great way to do that. And so I put documents online that allow students to choose a topic and then have original documents at their fingertips so they can be their own historians and make their own decisions. Are these valuable skills in our society? I think they're great skills. And I, I find, you know, uh, I hear from my former students who are sometimes attorneys. I have one who's, a, who's a, an oil industry analyst. And they all tell me the same thing. They say that, that knowing what questions to answer, being curious, never giving up until you find the truth are really great skills. That, and then of course with history, writing is a key to conveying what you find. And they always tell me that the writing skills they learned in my classes were key to their success in, in whatever line of work they've gone into. I'd like you to take your work kind of to the next level and talk about how is your work impacting society? Well, I'm a kind of modest person, so, so I don't usually like to answer that question. But, but I, th I think the main way in which my, my work these days influences society is because I think people tend to be relatively myopic about history. They tend to, to know about their own uh, group or their own time period, and, and they tend to have a lot of mythologizing about other periods of history. And so one of the things I like about my current work, which, which covers a 400-year span, is to help people see that things they think are unique today, really we've repeated throughout history, and that the problems we're going through are problems Americans have faced before, and that really we can in some ways take comfort from the fact that these problems have been there before, and we can hopefully learn from the ways that we've sometimes successfully, but sometimes unsuccessfully, dealt with those problems in the past to hopefully be able to deal with them better in the future. Now, you've put together an amazing career. Uh, what words of advice would you give to students who would like to take your work to the next level, to, to build upon your legacy? What would that look like? Well, I, I think one really important thing that I, I would tell students who want to go into history to do um, is to always be curious, to always ask more questions, never accept what is often the quote-unquote accepted truth, always, always question uh, authority that's handed down, and to always go back to the original sources and, and try to see whether the sources really say what we've been told they say. Because often we find that, that the accepted wisdom uh, really more reflected uh, the time that people were writing about, were writing in, than the time that people were writing about. And so often we, we try to kind of impose our modern conceptions on the past. And I think the next generation's job is to, you know, look at me and say, all right, what were Professor Ambinder's preconceptions? How might he not have been quite getting uh, at the bottom of of the, the answer to the questions that we want to ask and, and how can we maybe answer them differently. So, so I encourage qu students always to question not only what other historians say, but to question what I say and to ask me to back up what I, what I think with evidence. And often they change my mind and that's, uh, that's the most gratifying thing I ever have uh, in my teaching is to have students prove me wrong.
Um, uh, I don't like to see it on one hand, but I love to see it. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I want to thank you for coming and joining us today. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you.